I'm Matt Kiefer. I'm the data editor at the Chicago Reporter. Uh, I'm on leave currently, academic leave, at uh, Stanford. I'm a fellow, along with Natalia, with the John S. Knight Journalism Fellowships. I also work with Cheryl on the Big Local News Project. I want to show you uh, some of the work that we've done at the Chicago Reporter, which is a small nonprofit investigative newsroom based in Chicago that was started shortly after the American Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s. The reporter was founded in 1972 as a means to measure some of the progress that was intended to occur after the passage of the U.S. Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, uh, all of the reforms during the 1960s, during the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, following the work by Martin Luther King and others. It was uh, organized, the Chicago Reporter, by a, actually a faith community in a church, a coalition of churches in uh, the Chicago area. Uh, so the reporter has been doing data-driven investigative journalism into inequality since the 1970s. So it was ahead of its time in that way. More recently, we've been doing uh, data, modern data journalism as you would recognize it today. I was hired in 2016 as the first data editor of the Chicago Reporter. One of the first projects that we uh, worked on after I arrived was a database of police misconduct, uh, a database of lawsuits settled by the Chicago Police Department. Uh, so every time someone had a complaint about police brutality, uh, illegal search, uh, things of that nature, they would file a lawsuit with the city of Chicago and if they had a good case or if the city didn't believe that they would win, they would usually settle out of court uh, without conducting a trial. Uh, they would simply pass a list of cases to uh, be approved by the city council. It was essentially a list of case numbers and payment amounts and plaintiffs. And we decided that this process was going on essentially without much public transparency, uh, besides the fact that there was just a list of payment, uh, payments to be made. There wasn't much known about what sort of things uh, were happening that the police department uh, was involved in, that the city was responsible for paying for. So we decided to collect this information and make it more transparent and make it more uh, accessible by the public. Essentially what we do is we take that list of payments made by the city council uh, for settling police misconduct cases we hire interns to take the case number and look up the complaint documents that are filed in federal court. Uh, they're usually available online uh, with the federal government. Uh, when they sue in county court, we make a trip to the county courthouse down the street and we pull the paper files. But we get a list of all of the filings and the interns will then key in the data points about uh, the case, uh, who was involved, uh, where and when it took place, what sort of uh, incident it was, if it was a matter of uh, police brutality, did they use a taser, did they uh, shoot the individual. Um, there's uh, examples of, uh, many examples of excessive force, but also uh, examples of illegal search Sometimes the police will serve a warrant, uh, kick down the door, uh, raid the house, uh, searching for the wrong suspect. They had the wrong address, they were in the wrong house, and so families are terrorized and children are traumatized. 
and we have many examples of this. Um, we have been updating the database every year since 2016. We're about to update uh, the most recent uh, 2018 uh, data very shortly, uh, which will bring us to something close to 1,300 cases. Uh, currently we have 1,100 uh, since 2011. Um, by the time we update the database later this year, it will be close to half a billion dollars in lawsuits settled by the Chicago Police Department. Uh, so this is an example of doing data-driven investigative journalism that uh, impacts, uh, specifically impacts uh, black and Latino communities more so. Um, and so we attempt to research and expose and investigate issues that have a, a disproportionate impact um, on those communities. Chicago is the third largest city in America. Uh, it's also the most uh, segregated uh, in terms of race as well as income. And it is about approximately one third white, one third black, and one third Latino. Uh, so this is one of the most important projects <clears throat> that the Chicago Reporter has worked on uh, since, uh, well, in recent history. Um, beyond that, the Chicago Reporter has also uh, covered issues ranging from uh, public education, uh, labor, um, politics, economic development. Um, one particular project that we worked on uh, recently, I think, is a typical sort of textbook example of what kind of data-driven journalism we do on a smaller scale, uh, but uh, a more routine type of story than the police misconduct database, which was a story about wage theft, essentially when employers uh, don't pay uh, employees for the work uh, that they performed. Uh, the, the employee can then file a complaint with the Illinois Department of Labor. So this is a, a textbook example of someone who has a, a right or a guarantee under law, in this case a labor right, you know, to all of the uh, pay that they're entitled to, and when, when they're uh, wronged, when their rights are violated, they can file a complaint with the proper agency, in this case the Illinois Department of Labor. We did an investigation where a reporter uh, filed a Freedom of Information request for copies of all of the complaints to the Illinois Department of Labor to find out how often uh, this occurs and also importantly, how long it takes for the employee to recover their wages, if, if at all. And we also compared the results to a previous investigation that we had done five years before. In the past, we found that employees had to wait uh, something on the order of nine months to get their wages recovered, and that only a little bit over half of the cases were successful. Uh, in our later investigation, we found that the amount of time it took to have a wage theft complaint processed was more than a year, close to a year and a half, and that fewer than half of the uh, cases resulted in the employee's favor, so that a situation had gone from bad to worse. And we also investigated in the case, uh, in Chicago's case, again, because it's a highly segregated city, when you have the uh, zip code, the postal uh, uh, code for uh, a complaint, you can use census data and demography to infer uh, the, the race of the individual in many cases. So we essentially found that black and Latino communities had a disproportionate rate of complaints filed uh, per, uh, for the size of the workforce in that area. Uh, and so we highlighted that as part of our investigation as well. And so that was a typical example of the type of work that we've done in Chicago Reporter Investigations, which is because we measure uh, civil rights 
and the enforcement capabilities of institutions that are responsible for upholding those rights, we often take uh, the complaints that come to those institutions, we analyze that with census data to identify who may be affected and how especially how effective those institutions are at protecting the rights of uh, the individuals. One more project in uh, more recent work that the Chicago Reporter uh, has been involved with is a large collaboration of Chicago area newsrooms that uh, came together to collaborate on the uh, Chicago municipal elections earlier this year. This was kind of an unprecedented uh, election and an unprecedented collaboration in Chicago uh, journalism where essentially uh, five or later ten different newsrooms uh, decided to work together to put together information on who was running for election in the city of Chicago. Uh, we realized that each of these small nonprofit newsrooms, uh, while they had an interest in reporting the uh, work that was going on, uh, I should say the, uh, the campaign uh, leading up to the election, we didn't have the resources to necessarily uh, produce uh, our own sort of comprehensive election coverage. So we collaborated together uh, to do this. Uh, we translated uh, the work uh, into Spanish as well, uh, which we did also with this uh, investigation. Um, uh, so frequently we'll take uh, our work and we'll translate it from English into Spanish. Um, and we provided this information sort of as a service uh, for voters to understand a little bit more about who they're voting for uh, in the Chicago municipal election, which again was, was a historic and uh, important election um, in Chicago. I will uh, wrap up by talking about some of the work that I'm doing at uh, Stanford this year. Um, so essentially what I would like uh, to accomplish during my uh, time at Stanford is to take some of the processes that are involved in data-driven investigative journalism, specifically as it pertains to inequality, and to find ways to make this, uh, this important investigative work, which is time-consuming and labor-intensive, uh, but to take this work and streamline it uh, to make it easier to do, essentially to automate important uh, critical parts of data collection and data processing. Uh, one of the ways that I've worked on that is a project, uh, a side project that I've been working on for several years called FOIA Mail, which essentially will allow newsrooms to produce uh, massive, uh, large-scale, public records request campaigns. So essentially to take uh, hundreds or even thousands of local government agencies and send the same Freedom of Information Act request, the same public records request to each of those agencies, and then to manage the responses that come back so that when they send a response to the Freedom of Information request, uh, which they don't realize is being automatically generated. They're, they're simply fulfilling their legal responsibility to respond to the Freedom of Information request. Uh, those responses are then categorized and tagged. The file attachments are shipped over to uh, a file directory, and it provides a status report for the journalists who are operating uh, FOIA mail so that they are aware of which agencies have responded and what the status is uh, for each of them. So that is essentially uh, the first step of where I want to go with my fellowship year at Stanford. I want to do this all in the service of investigative journalism, which is to investigate uh, inequality. So my goal is to use this technology to collect information again about civil and human rights violations, to um, collate that, to organize it in a way 
that it can be analyzed and used for investigative journalism. So I think the next step, which is uh, something that I'm just starting to work on, is to think about ways how we might automatically process large quantities of information that are coming back from public records requests. And so how might automation help given hundreds or thousands of different data files? Uh, how do you fit that into a story model? How do you import that data so that it can be analyzed? Uh, the most important part of this being the limited resources of small investigative journalism outlets and the data collection and data processing, while very critical to the investigations, is also the most time consuming. So I'd like to explore ways to reduce the amount of time and cost of resources in producing that kind of work so that small newsrooms like my own can produce more high impact journalism. Thank you, Mike.